we look at the length of, of the ark was incredible. 450 feet long. You know, we don't have to just go to Genesis. We can go many places in the Bible. Psalm 104, 6, Thou covers it with a garment, or covers it with a deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. He gathered the waters of the sea together as in heap. He layeth up the depths in storehouses. Psalm 33, 7. If the earth, if our earth was reduced down to a 12-inch globe, all the water in all the oceans would not even fill one tablespoon. When you took, if you took all the water off our earth, what do you have left? Rock. You have a ball of rock. Is it all connected? It's all connected. It's one piece. You don't have pieces floating all over the place. They're not floating on top. They're all connected. We have water sitting on top of the low spots. And uh, today the oceans average 12,000 feet deep. If the earth were smooth, the water would be 8,000 feet deep. A mile and a half everywhere. What an incredible world. And why does earth have so much water compared with the other planets? Not only does the earth have a lot of water, visible water, but oceans cover 70% of our surface, but another 10 oceans worth of water may be entombed deep inside. And as I drilled six miles into the Earth's crust, wherever I drilled, we hit water. Reservoirs and reservoirs and reservoirs of water. Was it a worldwide flood? That's the question before us. Well, if it wasn't a worldwide flood, then why have an ark? Why have a boat at all? I mean, you had at least 80 years to travel across the valley to get to the other side. You don't need a boat. Even more important than that, if this is only a local flood or a regional flood, then why did each kind of animal, a land animal, need to go on the ark from all over the world? If it was only a local flood, you only had to take those in the Mesopotamian area or, or wherever it started. From that area. You didn't have to have such a big boat. Thirdly, even more important, if this is only a local flood or a regional flood, then why were birds put on the ark? Birds can fly. They don't need a boat. In fact, when God put the birds on the ark, He put seven of all the birds on the ark. Very interesting as you look in Genesis chapter 7, and, and the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by twos, the male and his female. But now listen to what he says in verse 3. Of the fowls also of the air by sevens. The male and the female. Why so many birds? If this is possible, if that's what he's saying. To keep seed alive upon all the earth. Who are the best scatters of seed? The birds. Very interesting as I thought about that. And, and um, maybe we can look at that more clearly. But uh, fourthly, even more important than this, if it was only a local flood or a regional flood, then were only some of the people wicked? God said the people were wicked all over the earth. Everyone was wicked. But even more important than that, if this is only a local flood or a regional flood, then God is a liar. Because he said he'd never destroy the earth again. He said, I'll never do what I just got doing. Let, look with me in, in Genesis chapter 9, in verse 11. In Genesis 9, 11. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. He said, I will never do what I just got done doing, and I'll never do it again. If this is a local flood, then God's a liar, because there have been thousands of local floods that have killed millions of animals. If this was a regional flood, then God is a liar because there have been tens of regional floods that have killed millions of animals. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should ever change his mind. This was a worldwide flood. It was not a local flood. It was not a regional flood. Because you can't do that. You can't put the water over the highest mountains by 15 and, uh, 22 and a half feet and stop. It doesn't work like that. 
What animals did you put on the ark? And as I ask that question around the United States, many people say, well, all of them. Many people would say all the animals went on the ark. And I say to them, you don't really mean that. What do you mean? How many of you believe that God, put, or Noah had to put these huge aquariums on the ark for the whales and the porpoises and the manatees and the sharks and the seals? Nobody would say that. He didn't put all the animals on the ark. L look what he tells us. He actually tells us which ones he put on the ark. In verse 17 of Genesis chapter 6, he said, Everything wherein is the breath of life. And then he goes on to say in chapter 7 and verse 15, They went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. You say, well, that could mean anything. Let's look at verse 21. In verse 21, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and, and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man. Look at verse 22. All in whose nostrils is a breath of life, of all that is in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground. Both man and cattle and the creeping thing and the fowl of the heaven, they were destroyed from the earth and no only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark. We realize that he did not have to put all the animals from all over the world on the ark. Where do most of the animals live on our earth? In the water. So we're not talking about a tremendous amount of animals that had to go on the ark. Most of them live in the water anyway. It's a water catastrophe. And yes, I believe most of them died also. But evidently God spared some of them. And you say, but Mr. Hanson, you've got dinosaurs going on that ark. Yes. Because I don't believe dinosaurs became extinct in 1700 years. I believe that there are actually, according to evolutionists, the Tuatera is the last survivor of the beakhead dinosaurs, and it's in zoos all over the world. So no, they're not all extinct. There are actually 21 species of Archaeosauria, of the dinosaur kind, and seven subspecies still living today. So yes, I have no problem with that. What was going on? What was going on during, uh, around the ark, outside the ark? I can just imagine all these animals crying out, Help! Help! Uh, I'm about to become a fossil! Or I'm about to become rock solid evidence! What's going on? Can you imagine the turmoil? The fear that was outside. You know, I can imagine uh, the, the rain starts coming out of the sky. When's the first time we see rain? As far as we know, biblically, the first time anybody saw any rain was at the time of the flood. It's the first rec recorded instance of rain. Plus, if there would have been a water vapor canopy, as we talked about in the last session, there couldn't have been rain because it would have been brought down as rain. And so we believe that there was no rain. And then the people see this rain coming out of the water, coming out of the sky. That must have been incredibly fearful. I can imagine some of them running over to the ark and going, Help! Help! I believe! I believe! Let me in! Let me in! You know, and if Noah had shut that door, it's very possible because of his, his compassion for the lost soul, he might have let them in. But you know, you need to understand something. God shut the door of that ark. God gave them 120 years. Time was up. There's a time in every one of our lives where the door will be shut and no more will it be opened. Choose you this day whom you will serve and serve. What's going on outside this ark? What an incredible catastrophe this is. You know, people say, when I talk about a worldwide flood, they talk about the, the water rain for 40 days and 40 nights, but that's not where most of the water came from. If you look in Genesis chapter 7, it says in verse, in verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of that month, that same day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken open. First thing that happened with the fountains of the great deep were broken open all over the earth. Can you imagine that incredible catastrophe? Our world is a huge round ball. And on that round ball, we have what's called a crust. The crust is very thin. If you took the size of our earth, 
down to the size of an apple. The skin of an apple would be thicker than the crust of our earth. And, and our crust being very thin is very brittle. It's broken in seven or twelve major broken spots and many minor broken spots. So you can imagine when the fountains of the great deep burst open all over the earth, breaking open that crust, probably possibly sending water miles into, into the sky. What else happens in all these broken spots of our earth? Earthquakes? You know when your earth is busting open over? You're going to have earthquakes everywhere. Not just in one spot, but all over the earth you're going to have earthquakes. Major earthquakes. Something the earth has never seen before. And the next thing, another thing that you're going to also see, it's along all these major breaks where you find all our, also all our major volcanoes. That's where all the major volcanoes are. We believe, as geologists, that at one time in Earth's history, tens of thousands of volcanoes all went off at the same time in Earth's history. What an incredible devastation that would have been. Sending particulates into the sky, particles and, and uh, aerosols, gases up into the sky, shielding out the sun. What amazing devastation that would have been. It wasn't just rain, but the rain did come. The windows of heaven were broken open. And so what do we find in the fossil record today? What do we look at when we see the fossil record? What we find is Precambrian rock at the bottom. Precambrian is before the flood. There are no fossils. None at all. Uh, except at the Edicarian layer in, in Australia, they say there's a a layer right there that does have some fossils, usually viruses and bacteria, but you wouldn't expect if evolution is true to find any down at the bottom. But there are, they did find a fish in Australia down in the Precambrian. But other than that, we basically find no fossils in the Precambrian. As soon as we get to the Cambrian, the layer right above, there's an explosion of fossils. Almost every phylum that's found in our oceans today is represented in the very first fossil record. The greatest mystery to evolution, the Cambrian explosion. Coral, sponges, sea anemones, hydroids. If evolution is true, we should, we, should, we should only find the very simplest animals in the beginning that slowly evolved over millions and millions of years into the simple plants and simple animals that over millions of years turned into the more complex array that's already there at the beginning. It's already there right from the very start. Many people say to me, Mr. Hansen, if there was a worldwide flood, then everything should be mixed up. We should have horses and cows and, and pigs and people at the bottom and everything at the top and everything all over. Not true. Remember, the fountains of the great deep broke open all over the earth. It didn't start on top. It started down at the fountains of the great deep and it took a month and a half for the water to come up higher and higher and higher and higher and higher to get to the highest peak. It took over a month and a half. Forty days and forty nights to get to the highest peak. So you would expect to find them sorted to some degree. You're going to actually find them in their habitat where they live. That's how they're going to be deposited. The bottom dwellers, they're going to be at the bottom. The ones that couldn't get away. Let me ask you a question. Who knows first when a catastrophe comes? Animals or people? Oh, animals. So who's smarter? Oh, never mind. If the animals know that a flood is coming or a hurricane or a tornado, they're out of there. But what about the animals that can't get away? The bottom dwelling, we call them benthos animals, bottom dwelling ocean animals, the ones that live at the bottom, corals, Sponges, sea anemones, hydroids, arthropods, crustaceans, some that walk around on the bottom, they're going to be inundated. When the fountains of the Great Deep burst open, the material is going to come over them very, very quickly. Submarine mudslides everywhere, all over the earth. So they're going to be buried in their habitat where they live. They're also going to be buried by their mobility. Could they get away or could they not get away? So they're going to be buried by that. When we went out on vacation out to the Green River Valley in Wyoming, we, uh, we went to an area where there were fish fossils. We dug out thousands of fish, but the whole bluff was 2,000 feet high, and it went for tens of miles in every direction. And it's all shale, and it's all filled with trillions of fish. 
we would take huge slabs of rock out, put it up on its end and pop it open, just like the pages of a book. It'd open up fish and fish and alligators and stingrays and birds and all kinds of animals that died catastrophically. They died of suffocation. They died breathing in all these particulates into their mouth. See, we know they died alive, being buried alive, because all their fins are splayed out. When a fish dies, the muscles relax, and they fall apart and decay and rot. But these all had their fins splayed out. In fact, some of them that we found, some of them were folded in half. Some of them were in their last meal. Some of them are all twisted, buried alive. They were buried so rapidly, so quickly, to get away from oxygen, bacteria, and scavengers so they could fossilize. What an incredible thing. We're talking about billions upon billions, billions of fish and other animals that were inundated by a flood and the layers go across the world, folks. Upon top of the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, the top 3,000 feet of Mount Everest is clamshells, crinoid stems, bottom-dwelling ocean animals. We have the Karoo Formation of South Africa. According to paleontologists, people who study fossils, there are over 800 billion vertebrates of all kinds of animals, animals from the Arctic, animals from the tropics, animals from the sky, the land and the sea, all ripped apart and thrown in a heap. And we say we see millions of these piles all over the earth. This is not a local flood, folks. This was a worldwide flood. They're going to be buried in their habitat. They're going to be buried by their mobility. They're going to be buried by their intelligence. And they're going to be buried by their body density. When we look for the dinosaur bones, we go to specific areas. And when we go to that specific area, we're going to find lots of dinosaur bones. Because they were the heavier. They were dropped off. There's a shoreline dump all along the Rocky Mountain Range. And that's where we find all these dinosaur bones. Just pile up. It's not just under Dinosaur Monument, under that one building. But it goes all the way up. And what an amazing thing to find all those. By the way, the top layer of Dinosaur Monument, where they find all those dinosaur bones, they, is called the Dakota Sandstone. A little bit farther north in Utah, they found in the Dakota Sandstone, 10 people. Men, women, children, and infants in the exact same rock as the dinosaurs. Yeah, but you're not told about that very often. There's a lot of things you're not told about very often. This was an incredible catastrophe that just ripped up things and dumped them in huge piles all over the earth. This is the kind of stuff we find in Wisconsin, in the lower part of Wisconsin. This is called the Ordovician, just above the Cambrian, the explosion. These are bryozoans and brachiopods and, and arthropods and crustaceans and sponges and all kinds of animals that were very complex that died in the beginning. This stuff is not just this thin, but it's hundreds of feet thick. It's incredible. We're not talking about a local flood. We're talking about an incredible worldwide flood. When we look in coal, coal seams that are supposed to be, you know, that they're supposed to be, according to evolution, 300 million years old, then how come we find bells and little iron pots? And how come we find hammers in this same material? Not only in coal, but also in the dinosaur rock. This is Cretaceous age. This is dinosaur rock that this hammer was found in. The hammer is 96.6% metallic iron combined with 2.6% chlorine and a little bit of sulfur. It made a steel that doesn't rust, and we can't make it. Nobody on earth knows how to make it. We believe if you put it in a hyperbaric chamber, we believe we could probably make that hammer. But that hammer was made by somebody. And it's in the same rock that a T-Rex was taken out of. What do we do with it? Should we just throw it away and say it doesn't exist? Or should we study it and say something's here that we don't understand. We need to look a little bit more closely. When we talk about the, the mountains, the mountain ranges, how, you look at mountains. Have you ever seen mountains that the layers go like this? They're all folded and bent and twisted? How did that happen? According to evolution, these layers were laid down very, very slowly over millions of years. According to them, millions of years ago when an inland sea covered the area, layers of sediment were slowly deposited and slowly compressed into the weight of newer layers into rock. 
millions and millions of years of layers, solid, hard rock. Then they say a pressure came up from underneath. What's going to happen to the rocks if you put a, bring a pressure up underneath solid rock? It's going to bust. It's going to break. We call it faulting, fracturing. You're going to have all kinds of material that are going to be busted out of it. But that's not what we see. I believe a better answer. See, that's not scientific or biblical. But I believe approximately 4,300 years ago, not 45, but 4,300 years ago, when the Genesis flood covered the face of the earth, that the layers of sediment were quickly deposited. And still in a semi-soft, semi-solid ability, the pressure came up underneath and was able to bend and fold and twist these rocks, realizing all these layers are different kinds of rock. They're all different densities. So you would not expect them to all bend and fold together unless they were semi-soft or semi-hard. This is, makes scientific sense and it makes biblical sense. After the worldwide flood, there was erosion. The waters hastened away, the Bible says, came off the continents very quickly, leaving huge caverns and caves and, and uh, also um, high pinnacles of sandstones and other things. This is a setup for the Ice Age. A recovery time takes place and then an ice, ice Age starts. Did Jesus Christ believe in a worldwide flood? Jesus said in Matthew 24 verse 36 He says in verse 36 But of that day and hour Knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not till the flood took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Folks, they didn't even know what hit them. It hit them so completely. That's why God tells us, Be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. The heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You believe the Bible? Do you, ever, do you believe that God uh, talks about a, world, uh, a big bang anywhere in the Bible? I found one. Yeah, it wasn't at the beginning though. It was at the end. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. That's the only big bang we're going to get. And that'll be in the end. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat in the earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to all be in all holy living and godliness? Since it is true that there really was a worldwide flood at one time in earth's history, since it is true that one day He is going to destroy our earth again, this time with fire, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons are we to all be in all holy living and godliness? He is not a part of our life if you're a Christian. He is your life. You don't live for yourself anymore. You live for Him. He says in Isaiah 43, 7, Even everyone who is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. Yea, I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. I pray that if you're not ready, that you will be ready. If you're here today looking at this video, I pray that you might realize all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death. Eternal separation from God forever. He says in 1 John, verse 6, chapter 1, If we say that we have fellowship with Him, we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the truth is not in us. John speaks in chapter 2, and he says, My children, my little children, these things write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation. That means the complete payment for not only our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. His desire is that none perish, but that all come to repentance. I pray that if you're listening to this, you might realize there's no sin out there that's small. Every sin that is sinned will affect not only you, it'll affect your spouse, it'll affect your children, it'll affect your grandchildren, it'll affect your workmates and friends and relatives. No little sin is little. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you've given to us to look a little bit closer into Genesis, looking at the worldwide flood. Lord, I pray that we might understand there is so much evidence that we didn't even weren't able to touch on. Lord, I pray that we might touch into your word, that we might look to your word for truth and find it. Lord, I pray if there's anyone listening that has never studied these things out, Lord, help them to study, to show themselves approved unto you, workmen that he hath not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I pray if there's someone here that doesn't know you, they might find you. We give our day and our life to you because we are yours. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.